One of the things that I love is that two films idea of your life. And there's like two stories you can tell. One that is safe and full of regret, and one that is risky and full of pride and joy. I don't think you need talks about food to be uh, to, to, to prepare yourself for lunch. There's wonderful food since we arrived here, and it's just a perfect place. I was looking around yesterday and just seeing so many happy people, you know, and I was so happy, and I said in my mind, and someone passed by and read my mind like a minute later. I don't remember who anymore. I'm sorry. And I was saying, wow, like this is real heaven for me. Everything's beautiful. Everybody's kind and perfect and smiling and... If the world was like this, unfortunately, the world is not like this. And unfortunately, it's very easy maybe to stay here, but I don't know if I have to do the easy choices. The hard choices is, you know, I don't think I'll be making a difference here. I don't think each one of us will be making a difference here between, between uh, similar people. You know, if we need to make a difference, we need to make a difference somewhere else. I'm trying to make a difference in a very, very small, way in a very small country called Lebanon. Most of you heard about this country through wars that happened in this place since such a long time, unfortunately. And someone yesterday was telling me, you know, or this morning, like, oh, wow, how small is this country? Why do we talk so much about it? You know, like, he saw on Facebook a comparison between the size of the UK and the size of Lebanon. It was like, wow, it's nothing. And why do we talk so much about it? I think we talk so much about it, not because I'm, sh I'm a Lebanese and I'm chauvinistic, maybe I am a little bit, but because, you know, it's a very specific country, because it's a country where the concept of the other does not exist. The other in the meaning, you know, of the majority and the small minorities that we call the other, you know, whether we are black or white, Christian or Muslim, mountain people or sea people, you know, just differences. Nearly everywhere in the world, there's like a majority and a small minority that we call the others. In Lebanon, there's no other. It's a half Christian, half Muslim country, half people looking to the east, half people looking to the west, half people li living on the sea, others living in the mountains. Some people wear veils, some people, some, some women wear veils, some women maybe walk in bikini in the streets. So it's a mixture of all of this. And what I find really exciting is that this must be a case study of the world of the 21st century, where, you know, ideas and people move so much and so fast. And, like, what are we going to do of it? You know, like, we look at this and, like, what are we going to do of it? Are we going to do Brexit? Are we going to shoot policemen, you know? Are we going to shoot each other, you know? Are we going... What are we going to do of it? I was born in 1969. The war broke out in Lebanon in 1975. I was five, six years old. And I never understood why this war broke down. I was on one side of the war, and you know, it was obviously we are right and they are wrong. Our God is right and their God is wrong. You know, our religion is right and their religion is wrong. It was like be between religion, between origins, between politics, between all of these things together. And I never, you know, really understood it. Like, how can I be right and you are wrong, you know? Or how can my God be right and your God is wrong? Or maybe. It's all right and wrong at the same time, and there is a bigger truth beyond all of this, you know, which is the real truth of life. And I was always curious, I was always questioning myself about all of these things, until well, I had to do something, and at one point, you know, I studied graphic design, I never worked in it, I finished my studies when the wars finished, ended in Lebanon. And this very small country, it's only 200 kilometers long on the eastern side of the Mediterranean. It's like the belly of the Mediterranean. 200 kilometer long by 50 kilometer large. Just a rectangle on the eastern shores of the Mediterranean. And all of this diversity is in this rectangle. And this rectangle, at the same time, a crossroad of people and civilizations and so many things. This very small country was divided into like, I don't know, five or six or seven different places. And we couldn't move from one region to another because it was the enemy. And if, you know, I was from a family that was politically or religiously, you know, uh, uh, involved, if I crossed to the other side, I would have been kidnapped or killed or mistreated. So one day in 1991, all the borders, the war ended. We don't know why it started. We don't know why it ended. And all the borders, like, vanished. And it was, like, all ours. 
And it was like, ah, really? But he was the enemy yesterday. What happens just overnight, you know? How can I go meet him and know him when I knew yesterday that he was coming to kill me and not to love me? And this is when, where someone asked me to write a guidebook about Lebanon, about this country that we heard so much about, but never, ever, ever, you know, visited. We heard from our parents, from people, you know, but never visited. So I went along all of these regions and places, and what struck me the most was the people, not the wonderful archaeological site or historical site or natural sites, but it was mainly the people, how everybody was the same. If you come to them with open arms and an open heart, they would have wider arms. If you come with a gun, they would kill you before you kill them. And I started, you know, to see the similarities between all of these different people. When I was raised all my life saying like, no, he's different, so he's not ours, so he's not like us. And I start seeing how people were completely the same. If they pray on a Friday, on a Saturday, on a Sunday, or on a Monday, by the end of the day, all these religions, all these politics came after the existence of humanity. And at one point, how can we all meet together around a common ground of humanity and ethics and nothing else but that? And not at all be the same, celebrate our differences, you know, celebrate this diversity and look for similarities beyond differences. It happened one day, there was a garden show in Beirut and the people of the garden show, later on I was to be, I wrote the guidebook and then I heard about something called slow food. I went to the second edition of, Terra, of, uh, of uh, the Salon del Gusto. I fell in love with them, they fell in love with me. I started collaborating a lot together. Then I discovered something called macrobiotics, which is like very weird, even in Lebanon, you know. And you know, macrobiotics was wonderful for me. It not, was not about being macromaniac, you know. It wasn't about miso soup, you know. It was just about having more answers to questions that were rising, you know, understanding energies of life, energies of food, all of these, you know, answers to different questions. From, so slow food, macrobiotics, macrobiotic cooking teacher, a TV show in Lebanon and in the Arab world, you know, starting to talk about how do you have the right to exist in an alternative way, eat in a different way, heal yourself in an alternative way, live in a different way, you know. Like if you want to wake, walk barefoot, well, walk barefoot, who gives a shit, you know. If it's good for you, if it's not pissing someone else, if it's not doing harm for some, someone else, so just do it. Why do we need to be like so stuck in all of these countries that are stuck mainly in their, you know, ways and in their mainly religion? So from all these different things, until 2004, where there was that, that first garden show in Lebanon. This is where I took care of the food section of the garden show. And it was about, you know, gathering some farmers and producers I was working with, writing about, you know, trying to support through what I could do. And we did like a small event at the end of that garden show. Ten producers only. And these ten producers were like a magnet, attracting, you know, everybody from this huge event to that place. Because we were talking about something that touches their heart. We were talking about food, we were talking about tradition, we were talking about real people, real farmers. All of the pictures that I'm showing you here are just pictures of people. I don't care, not to say I don't give a shit about the food itself. The food is just a way for us to communicate. I can tell you stories now, you're listening for me, I hope you're listening well for 20 minutes, you know. But you know, I can do this every single time and you can do so every single time. It's much easier if I'll just tell you, you know, like, let's have lunch today. Or if you hear about, you know, her, you know, doing like a special Welsh lunch. So it would be a way instead of like uh, listening to music, wonderful music maybe, which is difficult sometimes to understand or, you know, uh, listening to the story of Wales, like, who cares, you know, or like w watching the architecture or different expression. Food is the most sincere and authentic expression of people and place from all different expressions of tradition, you know. I'm not dressed in a traditional Lebanese way. I don't know the Lebanese traditional dance or poetry or music. I don't know all of these, you know. I may or may not live in a traditional Lebanese house, but I can't carry it on my, on my back, you know. It's the one and only expression of tradition that moves through time and place is food. Lebanese are five million in Lebanon, 15 million across the world. They didn't take their language. 
you know. So they didn't take their architecture or costume or anything. They just took their tabouli and their kibbe. And this is the best way of communication between people. And this is through this angle that I see it. So in 2004, started a project called Souk Tayyib. Souk means market, Tayyib means good. Good as of taste, obviously, but as of ethics. And in Arabic, Tayyib means alive. So it's all of these meanings at the same time. It started, and it still is, it's happening today. I'm very happy that I'm talking at the same time. It's as a Saturday morning farmer's market, and it's a producer's only farmer's market. Because all of the work that we do, we just see it as human development projects. And not at all about selling cucumber and tomatoes. It's how to support wonderful, small scale, clean as possible, very often organic, producers who are doing a wonderful job, but like who wants tomato in tomato village, village when everybody has the same, how to bring the producer to the city where he can have a direct contact, first of all, with the consumer. So the consumer understands that food is not a commodity product that you buy with money that you make on a supermarket shelf. But it's something that someone has produced, planted, or cooked. And if you can do it yourself, at least have a direct contact with a human being, a woman, or a man, who have done so. It is, you know, giving recognition to the farmer. In all languages of the world, farmer, you know, peasant is a bad word. In French, in English, in Arabic, in every language. Why is it a bad word? I don't understand. What wrong has this man or this woman did, you know, to deserve such, such a thing, you know? And it's bringing the producer to the city it's bringing a bit of the rural areas to the city, and it's for us to understand that it's not just developing cities. As we grow cities more and more, we need to grow the rural countryside more and more for it to feed the city. And for, you know, for the money, for the economy to go straight away and fully to the producer himself or herself and not to all system meanwhile. So it was all of these things together at the same time. We started in 2004. Today there is a big farmer's market every Saturday morning and a smaller one in a different place in the city in Beirut every Wednesday afternoon. In 2007 it was like, why do I have to bring the producer from rural to urban only? Why don't I go back to the villages you know, from time to time and go, go meet him or her in his own environment? This is where we started to do regional food festivals that we called Food and Feast, where we would go to Tomato Village, do a celebration of tomato fish celebration, you know, kibbe celebration. And during this day, I would go meet him in his own environment, you know. We would set up an example, you know, everybody thought, ah, he's a stupid farmer, who gives a shit, you know, the other guy, you know, built buildings and did many, you know, dollars. So he is an example to follow. So it's, no, guys, this is an example to follow too. And at the same time, we'd be celebrating everything what's wonderful in that village. And at lunch, what are we going to eat? We're not going to eat generic Lebanese. We're going to eat only what home cooks, what women cook in a very, very authentic and traditional way in their own homes. So we started identifying the good women, the good home cooks in the village. And we had this big table, you know, where every woman would be in front of her dish and so proud of what she did and feeding people, you know, from this buffet of women and their dishes, not dishes only. This, you know, these lunches, these Sunday lunches started to have like a great success. In 2009, we said, like, why do we have to wait one time a month or a year you know, to go eat in the village? Why can't we have it more easily in the city and more often? This is where we created, on November 5, 2009, a project called Tawli. Tawli is like a community kitchen. I can't call it restaurant. We call it the farmer's kitchen, where every day it's a different woman from a different village who would come and cook a buffet of 10 to 15 dishes, obviously with the support of the team of the place of Tawli. And it would be like if she was hosting people in her own house. Tawle Beirut is for women's recipes and ingredients of all over Lebanon. And since 2009 until today, we developed four different tawles in, in different regions where every one of these tawle, tawle means table, so it's like coming home to mom and eat at the kitchen table, not in the dining room. So this is what it means. Tawle is table. And today we have like four different kitchens all around the country, and each one of them is specific and typical for women, recipes, and ingredients of the regions only. Doing all of this, it was like, we need to fine tune, we need to help the farmers, we need to help the cooks in doing better what they were doing. 
So we started doing what we call the capacity building programs in helping one-to-one -one the farmer or the producer or the cook or doing workshops. We saw the importance, you know, of supporting the farmers. And then we said, like, why do I have to keep it only for our own group of farmers and cooks? Why don't we look at the neediest cases? So we started doing capacity building programs, support programs, in Palestinian camps in Lebanon, people who are in terrible condition like we can never, ever imagine since 70 years in Lebanon. Later on arrived the Syrian refugees, so we started working with them. We worked later on with migrant domestic workers. In Lebanon, you can have a house worker, a maid, for like $200 a month who, full, who lives full time with you, doesn't have much uh, rights. You have the right to hold her passport or his passport, you know, so it's terrible conditions. We worked on war fronts in Tripoli, bringing 20 war widows, one, 10 from each side, putting them in one kitchen together. The first session, women were, were like, the tension was like, I cannot tell you. These are from two different worrying sides, and they had conflict by that time. After three months of training, like, who gives a shit about the cooking? They were wonderful cooks, they did great, they had, you know, like, they, they had, like, a wonderful catering menu. All of this is great, but by the end of the three months, both women from, women from both sides understood that, you know, you have the same anger, you have the same pain, you have the same dreams, fears, and expectations, and I'm in the same case too. Either we're gonna go on you know, doing war as we're doing, or we're gonna get around a common ground. So, I'm sorry I didn't talk a lot about food. I'm glad I was the first one and not the last one. All what we do, we just see it as human development projects. How to support people who think they are nothing, you know, like I'm a refugee. Can you, we're living in a tent and it's wonderful, you know, like, ah, there's a bed and it's great, it's an experience, I Instagrammed it today, it's like wonderful, I had a lot of replies, it's like, woof, so exotic. <laughs> but guys, if each one of you, I don't know if we are all in tents, in tents or wherever you are, if each one of you, I just found my gel bottle, you know, that I forgot that I found it now. If I went to my bag tomorrow morning and didn't find it, I would have been, you know, like, Disturbed, stupid gel bottle. If each one of you now think, if he will go back to his tent or wherever he is, or to your house, you're going back to your house tomorrow or on Monday, you're going back to your house, you're going to get in, just picture it in your mind, and you would find someone walked in and stole your toothbrush. How would you feel about it? Some people didn't have only their toothbrush lost. Some people had a life. Under a dictator, yes, I know what it is. But still, they had a life. They had a job, they had kids, they had a grandma, they had cousins, they had everything like every one of us. So that we don't notice any, anymore, you know, what a blessing we're living in. And overnight, they lost it all. People are not throwing themselves in the sea because ah, they love Lesbos, you know? Or they would love to go to Germany. And they know that 30% of them will get killed. And 70% of them will not get there. But whatever it is, they are just fighting for their lives. How can we support, you know, through simple actions? Gandhi said, be the change you want to see. And I adore the title that you gave, David, to, you, to your lectures. It's called the Do Lectures. What each and every one can do through the easiest way, me and a bunch of people try to do it through stupid tomatoes and cucumber or a stupid lunch, you know, through very, very simple things. How can each and every one of us, through every single action that we do, every single word, every single breath, do a positive contribution to the world. Be the change you want to see in this world. Thank you.